I was able to create a chart by my theoretical s schemes and uh, noticed there were holes in the chart and predicted the existence of the particles to fill up the chart, and that, that those all work. But then the question was, was there some subunit out of which all of these particles were made, these strongly interacting particles? And, uh, well, I tried it, and it came out that you could do it with uh, a certain set of particles in a quite economical way, but they would have to have electric charges plus two-thirds and minus a third. And, of course, all known particles had integral charges in units of the proton or electron charge. The proton is called plus one. The electron is called minus one. And all the known particles had charges of plus one or minus one or possibly plus two or minus two and so on. And nothing had a fractional charge in those units. But these f subunits that were most, for, that would give the most economical scheme for making what we saw out of hidden subunits, these subunits would have charges plus two-thirds and minus a third, and I was initially discouraged about that. Then I made a visit to Columbia University, and a colleague there, Bob Serber, asked me uh, whether I had ever considered this economical way of, of making subunits, considering what we then called a triplet. And I said, yes, I have considered it, but they come out to have fractional charges. And I showed him the fractional charges on a napkin at the uh, faculty club at Columbia, where we were having lunch. And, uh, and then thinking about it during the rest of the day, it occurred to me that if they were completely hidden, these particles, if they never came out, but they were permanently trapped inside the known particles, then it wouldn't cause any uh, difficulty, any uh, disagreement with observation or with any fundamental theoretical idea. And so I began to put it forward right then. And, uh, but I, my attitude has been misunderstood all these years, and there are zillions of books which describe the history of this and could describe it quite incorrectly. And in fact, the Nobel Foundation, in, in awarding very, uh, uh, the uh, physics prize this year to three experimental colleagues who richly deserved it, my very good friend Dick Taylor and uh, my friends uh, Henry Kendall and Jerry Friedman, uh, in awarding it, they mentioned that before the experiment, people thought of quarks as merely mathematical. Now, that's true, but what I meant by mathematical was that they were perfectly real, but trapped inside the neutron and proton and the other observable, strongly interacting particles, which was correct, completely correct. And other people, after the quark idea was put forward, came up with the notion that maybe they were directly observable. And that was wrong. But for some reason, the history has twisted it around so as to make my statements about mathematical character of quarks, which I believe from the first day that they wouldn't come out. Uh, they've twisted it into a statement that they weren't really there, that I thought they weren't really there, which is not the case at all. It's a very strange perversion of a fact that, that makes its way into history sometimes, and this is one of those cases. It's true everywhere, and I've tried very often with authors of lots of accounts, books and papers and articles and so on, to explain to them the situation, but it never, it never does any good. <laughs> so my being right has been converted into some kind of crime by history. Isn't that strange? I find that particular aspect frustrating. I mean, it's nice to be credited with the quarks and uh, have those Swedish Foundation refer to my work in awarding the prize to these three wonderful experimentalists who uh, confirmed the existence of quarks and inside the proton. I was delighted with all of that, but I was not delighted with this funny interpretation. Actually, the Nobel Foundation didn't, uh, didn't say it, didn't, didn't actually state the thing wrong. But the implication was that, uh, that by calling them mathematical, I was sort of denying their existence. What I meant by mathematical was that they wouldn't come out and be seen individually and directly in the laboratory. And that's turned out to be so. They are permanently trapped inside. We didn't understand, of course, back in 1963, I didn't understand why they are permanently trapped inside. But later on, when we formulated the dynamical theory, quantum chromodynamics, then we began to realize what was going on.
I had the sound quark but it could have been spelled differently, for example, K-W-O-R-K or something like that. I thought it was a nice sound and didn't mean anything, I thought, and that was good, that was good because when we give fancy Greek names to things, and of course I can do that, uh, but when we give fancy Greek names to things, they usually, it usually turns out that what they mean uh, later uh, is not so appropriate as we thought at first. Uh, the protod, for example, the first thing, it means fundamental. Well, it turns out it's not fundamental. <laughs> so, the name proton is very learned, but uh, it turned out not to be apt. Now, a quark, if it didn't mean anything at all, was not going to be obsolete ever. So, anyway, that was fine. That was the, the sound. But then, leafing through uh, James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake, as I sometimes do, it's a copy my brother bought, actually, when it first came out in the United States in 1939. And uh, leafing through it, I saw the, uh, the, the phrase, uh, three quarks for Muster Mark. And I thought that would be very good. And uh, so I spelled it Q-U-A-R-K. Now, Joyce undoubtedly meant it to be pronounced quark because it goes with bark and hark and mark and so on. But, um, but I figured out a rationale for pronouncing it quark, which is that in three quarks from Muster Mark, of course, there's multiple determination of the word, as in many other cases in Finnegan's Wake. And what I figured was that one source out of the multiple, of the many determinants of the word, one source was perhaps the fact that the dreamer, uh, whose dream the book is, is Humphrey Chimpton Earwicker, who's a barman, is a publican, he owns a bar. And uh, frequently through the book you hear people giving orders for drinks at the bar, drinks to take away, and so on. So this one of the determinants of three quarks for Muster Mark could be three quarts for so-and-so, uh, an order to the bar. And I still think that may be true, although there are many other more important factors that have gone into the phrase. Uh, anyway, that allowed me to interpret that maybe it was pronounced quark instead of quark. But uh, the commentators on, on uh, Finnegan's Wake think that, and I think correctly, that, that the main thing it refers to is three cries of the four gulls that are following the ship on which Tristan and Isild are uh, traveling. Uh, and they're making fun of King Mark because uh, Tristan and Isolde are having a love affair. And uh, those four gulls occur throughout the book as four evangelists, four old men in the park, uh, and so on and so forth, four commentators of various kinds. And in this case, they're four gulls following this ship. And quark is listed in the dictionary as the cry of a gull. So that's undoubtedly the primary determinant. But maybe three quarts for so-and-so has a slight connection with it as well. And that would justify pronouncing it quark instead of quark. The story I told just now about the sound and the meaning and so on is all in the Oxford English Dictionary. Because they asked me for a detailed description and I sent them a detailed letter about it. I think it's the only article in the Oxford English Dictionary that's based on a private letter. Initially, a lot of things I did were not taken very seriously, and, uh, but then finally people realized that they were right. The quark certainly wasn't taken seriously by most people no. for quite a while, no, for many years it wasn't. regarded as some crazy thing. And people, as I said, misunderstood what I meant by saying that I thought they were mathematical. They thought I was going back on the original idea and saying they weren't true. Whereas what I meant was that they were stuck inside permanently, which we finally found to be true, and we finally understood more or less why, why it's true. Uh, but then later on, people began accepting all sorts of very tentative ideas of mine as important and working on them, and that was sort of embarrassing. I would put forward some not very serious idea just as a passing remark and lots of people would start working on it. So, sort of the opposite effect.
many of the best things I did were not treated, were not received very well at first. But I think that's fairly common. People don't like to change their ideas. They're very comfortable staying in the same basin of attraction. Needs a lot of noise to shake them out of one basin of attraction into another. That's how you get a good new idea, is by shake, being shaken somehow into a, into a new basin of attraction. And uh, usually it happens uh, spontaneously. As you know, you fill yourself up with the problem and then can't make any further progress by conscious effort, but sometime at some odd moment uh, when you're doing something else, uh, thinking about something else, the idea comes to you. And people have asked the question, uh, can't you perhaps accelerate that process, artificially uh, uh, induce uh, the movement into another basin of attraction so that you can try a different idea? And it's possible you can, by some sort of random noise. Various suggestions have been made about how to do that. A random noise is one way to shake yourself out of your basin of attraction in which your ideas are stuck into various other basins until you might find a better idea. For example, Edward de Bono suggests using the last noun on the front page of today's newspaper to solve your problem, whatever that noun is. Well, that's certainly random. It's random noise introduced into the solution process, and maybe it can accelerate the process of getting a creative idea, shaking yourself out of your old basin into a new one. Maybe there is a way to jumpstart that process, yes, to accelerate the getting of uh, correct creative ideas, useful creative ideas. But in any case, the process, the, the normal, a uh, spontaneous process is apparently common to a great many fields. Uh, psychologists have noted that, uh, artists and scientists and others have written it down, and we discovered it independently at a seminar in Aspen in 1969 where we had painters and poets and theoretical physicists and a, a theoretical biologists all talking about our experiences of getting useful ideas, and they were all just about the same, and they all followed that same pattern. Helmholtz wrote about it a hundred years ago, or more, more than a hundred years ago, and he called the phases saturation, where you fill yourself up with the problem but can't solve it. Incubation, the problem is hidden away and something deep inside you is working on it, some mental process out of awareness in what the shrinks would call the pre-conscious mind is, is working on it. And then illumination, when suddenly a good idea breaks through. And then Poincaré described this process also, and he described the fourth rather trivial stage, which is verification, checking to see that the idea actually works. It's written up apparently in a book by Graham Wallace, the psychologist Graham Wallace in 1926. So 43 years before we had our seminar, this whole conclusion had already been written down in a book. And about 100 years before, it had been written down by Helmholtz. Uh, Nevertheless, it may be that one can uh, circumvent that process, accelerate it, jumpstart it. That'd be really interesting. Just a slip of the tongue. Yes, and that's how I figured out the explanation of strangeness. I had come up with an incorrect explanation, which had some features in common with the correct one, but, but was wrong, and I knew why it was wrong. And uh, some, another fellow had gotten the same idea and figured out that it was wrong and written a letter about it, which was published. I hadn't published anything, but he had published the idea plus the reason why it was wrong. But in a very confused manner, so that it was extremely difficult to follow. And I hadn't even read it, but I knew what it was because I had had the idea and I knew why it was wrong. And when I visited the Princeton Institute for Advanced Study, where I had been working a short time before, the, the theoretical physicist there asked me to explain uh, how this worked, how the idea went, and why it was wrong. And I said, yes, I can do that. And I went to the blackboard, and I started explaining the idea, and explaining why it was wrong. And part way through, I made a slip of the tongue, and I realized that the slip of the tongue made it OK. The arguments against no longer were valid, and this was probably the right answer. And that was how I found the strangest theory. I wanted to say five halves, and I said one instead of five halves. It's not close in any way. But one worked, and five halves didn't. So obviously it was some interesting mental process going on out of awareness. <laughs>
the problem was being solved and the solution was being stated by a mental process out of awareness. It came out in a slip of the tongue. Shrinks would love that, I guess. A lot of people think it's not very scientific to try to think about that, but I think it's a perfectly valid question for science. What, is there a threshold of complexity for, for the phenomenon of consciousness? What is the phenomenon of consciousness? How do you describe it? One thing that's clear is that um, in our uh, human mental processes, uh, there are a lot of things going on at once, many parallel threads going on uh, at once, but that our attention is not focused on more than one, one during a very brief time, like a fortieth of a second. This is a sort of unit of time for attention, psychological attention, something like a fortieth or a fiftieth of a second. And during that fortieth or a fiftieth of a second, it doesn't seem that we can concentrate attention on, on a great many things, more like one thing. Uh, but we can jump around a lot. And so we get the impression, for example, that we're following several conversations at once. But probably what we're doing is just sampling them serially and using the redundancy of the conversations to fill in. And if the conversation consists of reciting a series of random numbers, then we cannot fill it in because there's no longer any pattern that you can use to fill in what you've missed. Um, now, what that means is that there's a lot of information processing going on in parallel, but the searchlight or spotlight of consciousness is, seems to be a, a serial, sequential, a sequential element in this uh, mess of parallel things. This, then this, then this, then this, then this, then this, then this. And the nature of that spotlight is uh, still quite unclear, I think. Now, this is all, of course, in fields far from the ones I've been trained in. So uh, I'm obviously not going to make any contribution to it through uh, uh, studying uh, that particular kind of science. But by looking generally at thresholds of complexity and looking generally at complex adaptive systems and the laws that govern them, we might come up with some principles that will help to uh, illuminate uh, the nature of consciousness. A direct attack on it would have to be made by people who are professionally trained to, to study uh, psychological phenomena. We deal with real uh, scientists or real scholars, humanists, whatever they are, from these various fields. Real psychologists, real economists, real linguists, real mathematicians, real chemists, and so on. And they assure us then that when we think about these subjects, which are often far from those in which we were trained, that we're not doing phony linguistics, phony <laughs> uh, mathematics, and so on. That would be a pity. The existence of all these uh, highly trained, highly skilled, rather famous people often in their own fields uh, assures us that we're not too far off the track when we're discussing these various kinds of subject matter. But at the same time, we have to have people who are willing to be flexible and not just bring to the conversation a bunch of uh, uh, cliches from their own subjects that they're unwilling to vary. They have to be people who are flexible in their thought processes, but at the same time very much aware of the, of the facts of their own subjects. Well, I had a very strong sense when I was a little child, uh, but I didn't go ahead and do that. Uh, I wanted to be an archaeologist uh, and perhaps a linguist and uh, I had absolutely no inclination to work on physics, none whatsoever. I uh, was in my senior year in high school and I was applying for admission to Yale for the following year and one of the questions on the application form was if you were admitted to Yale, what will be your major subject? And I thought I would discuss that with my father, not for any particular reason. It didn't matter what I filled in. Because when I got to Yale, if I was accepted, I could have changed it to anything else. It really didn't matter at all. But it was, it seemed a thing to do. We didn't, my father and I didn't discuss many things, and it seemed like something that would be useful to discuss with him. So I mentioned it. 
And uh, he said, well, what are you thinking of putting down? And I said, well, archaeology, linguistics, uh, so on. He said, you'll starve. He was very much impressed with the, he was, uh, with the effects of the uh, Depression, uh, which had, uh, among other things, completely changed his position in life. And he felt that uh, I should have some reliable source of income, some skill that would allow me to uh, to make a living even in uh, under difficult economic circumstances. I said, "Well, what would you like me to study?" And he said, "Engineering." And I replied, uh, "I'd rather starve." And uh, besides, uh, if I build anything, it would fall down. I really don't have any talent for engineering. Uh, so then he said, well, why don't we compromise on physics? And I said, you must be joking. I took a f course called physics in high school, and it was the only course in which I did badly. It was uh, really terrible terrible class. Uh, we studied the seven kinds of simple machine. We memorized the names of the seven kinds of simple machine. And uh, we learned the three forms of Ohm's law, E equals IR, I equals E over R, R equals E over I. <laughs> and we studied about mechanics and wave motion and electricity and magnetism and uh, acoustics and so on and so forth without ever seeing any connection among all those subjects. And uh, surely you wouldn't want me to go on studying that. My father said, well, if you keep studying physics and you study advanced physics, it'll be very different. You'll learn about relativity and quantum mechanics and it'll be really exciting. And so at that point I decided not to pursue the conversation. And I said, well, I'll write down physics. Uh, knowing that it didn't make the slightest difference when I got to Yale, I could change it if I ever got there. Well, I was indeed admitted to Yale with a very generous scholarship, and the next year I went there. And, uh, but I was too lazy to switch from physics to <laughs> some other major. <laughs> and so I continued doing physics. And Eventually, it was true that quantum mechanics and relativity were really exciting. I enjoyed them, and uh, I kept on doing theoretical physics. My father uh, read a good deal, but what he did most uh, when I knew him was to study uh, math and physics and astronomy as an amateur and try to learn about them. But I don't know exactly how far he got. In certain very special kinds of uh, mathematics, not terribly advanced, but rather specialized. He made a lot of progress, and in other things I really don't know. But I know he spent a huge amount of time poring over math and astronomy and physics books. But I was mainly my elder brother from whom I learned things. He, in turn, had learned a lot from my father. But in my case, it was mostly my elder brother, Ben, who was nine years older, who introduced me to the wonders of the world. We loved nature and we spent a lot of time outdoors learning about birds and trees and flowers and mammals and so on. It was really great. Natural history was a passion which I think I acquired from my brother. We thought of New York City as a hemlock forest that had been too heavily logged. And uh, we spent a lot of time in the little fragment of hemlock forest that was still standing. Particularly birds. Uh, my brother was passionately interested in birds, and I became so also. I still am. So it's become a sort of competition now uh, among uh, heavy hitter bird watchers uh, all over the world to try to see as many species as possible. And of course, there the location matters enormously. The record is held, I think, by the Manu. National Park in Peru. But I know people in Africa have done very well, and people in Texas do extremely well, and so on. This area isn't bad, Southern California, for seeing a great variety of birds in one day. Through my brother, I became interested in a great many different things. Uh, I just attended his uh, 70th birthday party a little while ago.
two weeks ago, in fact, in southern Illinois. And I told about all the things I had learned from him, many of the things I had learned from him. He taught me to read, for one thing, at a cousin's house from a sunshine cracker box. And then, uh, well, we were interested together in all sorts of things, uh, archaeology and uh, history and uh, art to some extent. We would go to art museums. And we went to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York sometimes. He would sketch the uh, ancient Greek statues, and I would go look at the Egyptian antiquities, and things of that kind. Uh, I talked about nature, about birds and butterflies and, and uh, plants. Uh, we talked about uh, a great many other things, languages, uh, just, about, just about everything. And what was nice was that we didn't distinguish sharply among them by, with artificial boundaries and say, now we're talking about art and now we're talking about science, and now we're talking about social science. And, so on. It was just all the richness and beauty and, uh, and order uh, in the world. Well, my mother didn't uh, have much to do with that sort of thing. Uh, my father uh, was probably happy that I was learning things, but uh, he never, he wasn't the sort of person to give a lot of encouragement. He actively discouraged the natural history expeditions. He didn't like that sort of thing. I, I don't know why. I've never figured out exactly why. I think maybe it's because he grew up in the backwoods. His father was a forester in an extremely remote part of the then uh, Austrian Empire. And, uh, and I think he was so glad to get into a city he never wanted to leave. <laughs> and <laughs> didn't like the idea of my poking around in the woods and swamps and so on. I liked short stories very much. I've always liked short stories. So I devoured the Sherlock Holmes stories by Conan Doyle, the Father Brown stories by Chesterton, even though I didn't like uh, Chesterton's attitude toward the world. I enjoyed the stories. Uh, the Saki stories, H.H. H. Munro's short stories, so forth. I guess my favorite reading was a really thick book of all the short stories of some prolific author. Most people don't appreciate the power of theory. I like to give illustrations, which are from relatively ordinary things. Uh, for example, here along the California coast, we have a lot of uh, places uh, with Spanish names, named by Spanish explorers. And uh, people who live here know that. But it never occurs to them that there's a theory of the name. At least it doesn't occur to most of them that there's a theory of the names. But in fact, uh, they're related to one another by a set of laws because they were almost all named after the day on which the sailing voyage reached them. So if you have a Catholic calendar and a map, you can trace the sequences of names along the California coast according to the saints' days and so forth that, that uh, were the days of discovery. And you see that on three voyages or so, the, virtually all the names were given in sequence. And of course, one of those names is Punta Año Nuevo, Point Año Nuevo, New Year's Day, which was discovered on New Year's Day. But then uh, the, the other nearby points and, uh, and towns uh, were also named after days in December and January preceding and following New Year's Day. It's a matter of fashion, uh, whether uh, the schools like to promote people rapidly if they are, show a capacity for being promoted rapidly or not. Sometimes the prevailing educational philosophy is that you have to leave people with their age group, and sometimes it's that you don't, but you promote them. Uh, at that time, uh, skipping, uh, as it was called, was, was popular. Shortly afterwards, the schools stopped, mostly stopped doing that. One system is to uh, leave uh, kids in the, in the class uh, that with uh, the kids their own age, but give them a lot of advanced material to work on. But then it matters whether they have to do the regular dull classwork as well. 
if they are excused from the usual stuff and sit in the back of the room doing uh, calculus and so on, that's, I think that's better than having to do the, the usual junk plus uh, material for enrichment. So that latter, I think, is, uh, is terrible. Doing all this stuff that they've learned years before and that they know perfectly and is pure drudgery, plus material for so-called enrichment, I think that's an extremely poor plan. I skipped enough so that I wasn't completely bored, no, I, uh, but I usually learned the stuff right away, uh, or at least often, I shouldn't say usually, but in many classes I learned a lot of the things at the beginning. Uh, but there were others where it continued to be interesting all through the year, history classes, for example. We happened to have a very high-quality history teacher in grade school. He was, uh, shortly afterwards, became uh, chairman of the history department at Barnard, but at that time, during the Depression, he was teaching grade school. I didn't, at the time, like him particularly, but he was certainly a very good teacher. Uh, later on, I liked him, and uh, so just at the end of his life, we got to know each other again. We talked about lots of things that we had done in between, and uh, he was uh, he was writing a history of uh, President Franklin Roosevelt's some of President Franklin Roosevelt's uh, uh, dealings in foreign affairs, particularly in connection with Indochina. And uh, he was astonished to know that I knew some things about that. And so we talked, we talked about it. It was very interesting. Well, uh, he and many lesser writers of so-called science fiction uh, dealt with the future, and that was interesting because the future is the future is fascinating, and uh, in most serious literature, one couldn't see much discussion of it. Uh, you remember the Ibsen play where uh, the two there are two historians, the woman's husband, who is a rather conventional historian, and her lover, who is a more daring one. The daring historian's book goes right on into the future. <laughs> Why? The other historian says, but, uh, but what can we know of the future? And the writer says, well, there's a thing or two to be said about it just the same. We, we don't know about it, but there's a thing or two to be said about it just the same. So many uh, scientists have gotten into science through science fiction. I think that's, that's true. Another thing is that, uh, and it's not particularly true about H.G. Wells, but it was true about some of the science fiction magazines, that they discussed uh, active questions in science, where the books you could get in the library and so on were mostly very far out of date and did not discuss uh, active questions. And even in college, I found I couldn't get anybody to talk with me about uh, contemporary questions in science. Well, it was a difficult time. It was during the war, and most of the best people were away. But still, uh, well, even after the war, when they came back, it was still very difficult to, get <laughs> to discuss active research questions. You were fortunate. There's this idea, you know, that students are aren't good enough to know about what's going on in science. They should be told some old stuff. And that's, uh, but as time goes on, uh, items in the curriculum are moved down toward more elementary classes as it gets easier to talk about them. But the new items are usually put out of reach of the students. It's a funny custom which I don't particularly approve of. I don't know why they can't be told about the latest stuff. I don't see that it does any harm to tell them about that. You may not be able to tell it to them in, in its full glory, but you can tell them a lot about what's going on, and I don't know why that's so bad. Certainly, as uh, notation improves, it gets easier to, to teach things to uh, more elementary students. I'm sure in Roman times that multiplication with Roman numerals was a graduate subject. Uh, as people learn better notation, it became easier to teach multiplication. It was able, they were able to move it down in the curriculum. Well, those are some of the greatest achievements of the human mind, relativity and quantum mechanics.
They are spectacularly interesting. And of course, they opened up the question of how general relativity and quantum mechanics would be combined together in a successful theory. And for that, we have now here at Caltech and elsewhere the uh, the first candidate theory in, in history for uh, a unified quantum field theory of all the particles and all their interactions, which does actually uh, reconcile uh, quantum mechanics with uh, general relativity. Uh, whether it's right or not, we don't yet know, but it's spectacularly exciting that for the first time in history there's a candidate theory that seems to have the right properties, to be the right overall theory of all the particles and all the interactions. It's developed by my friend John Schwartz and his colleagues in great part right here on this floor. First of all, there are the fundamental laws of physics, uh, one of which is the unified quantum field theory of all the particles and all the interactions that I was talking about a moment ago. And in the uh, superstring theory of John Schwartz and his colleagues, we are, uh, have a, the first really good-looking candidate for that, and may be right. If, even if it's wrong, I believe that it will turn out to be an important step on the way to the right one. But what's quite possible is that it's actually right. The other part of the fundamental law of physics is the boundary condition uh, near the beginning of the expansion of the universe, what some people irreverently call the Big Bang. I don't use that phrase because it was originally used by people who didn't believe in it and were trying to make it sound stupid. Uh, Anyway, that boundary condition uh, needs to be adjoined to the fundamental equation if we're going to get the complete laws of, of physics. And there also we have a candidate. Jim Hartle, my colleague and collaborator, and 25 years ago my graduate student here at Caltech, but now a professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and Steve Hawking of Cambridge, who has attracted a lot of attention with that book called A Brief History of Time that so many people have bought and claim to have read. Uh, the, uh, the two of them, Hartle and Hawking, formulated a number of years ago uh, a candidate for that uh, initial condition of the universe. And it might be right also. Uh, we don't know, but again, it's the kind of thing that might possibly be right. Their condition is particularly interesting because their condition utilizes the same formula that would describe the unified quantum field theory of all the particles and all the interactions, which would mean, if they are right, that uh, there is only one fundamental law. The equation and the boundary condition would both be given by the same formula, which is really exciting. Um, anyway, that so much for the fundamental laws of physics. We may be very close to knowing them. But that's not all there is, because the description of the universe in quantum mechanics is a probabilistic one. The fundamental laws do not tell you the history of the universe. They tell you probabilities for an infinite set of alternative histories of the universe. And uh, what we see about us is the result not only of the fundamental law, but of all those many throws of the quantum dice that determine the specific features of the universe. So whereas, for instance, the statistical distribution of the shapes of all the galaxies in the universe is probably determined by the fundamental laws, the shape of our own galaxy, the specific shape of a particular galaxy, is probably also the result of a lot of accidents. And the same is true of this particular star, like the sun, and a particular planetary system, like the system of planets around the sun. A particular planet, like the Earth, is the product not only of the fundamental law, but also of an innumerable uh, set of, a uh, very large set of uh, accidents. Uh, the same applies to the evolution of life on the Earth which uh, contains many, many features that are attributable to accidents that are, in principle, unpredictable. The same with particular forms of life, and the same with particular individuals. For example, every human individual is the result not only of fundamental laws, but also of a huge chain of 
completely unpredictable accidents. So that um, the rich fabric of the universe as we see it around us is co-determined by the fundamental law and this long sequence of accidents. And to understand how that appears, we have to understand a whole different part of science, which is uh, how a uh, system uh, that learns or adapts or evolves uh, can exist in the universe, and how it processes information so as to make some sort of picture of the universe. And we human beings, of course, are among those complex adaptive systems. Life as a whole can be thought of as a complex adaptive system. Uh, parts of living creatures, like the immune system, can be considered to be complex adaptive systems. Uh, the brain or the mind, which is the manifestation of the brain, can, can be thought of also as a complex adaptive systems. Uh, computers that are programmed to invent strategies can also be thought of as complex adaptive systems. And all of these uh, process information in, in particular ways that are, uh, seem to have a lot in common. Varying circumstances which are the result, uh, at least in part, of long chains of accidents, completely unpredictable accidents. Now, that's true of uh, the quantum nature of reality, that, that we have all these, in principle, unpredictable accidents. But even in the approximation of so-called classical physics, when the specific quantum effects are ignored, there is still the famous phenomenon of chaos. Uh, in uh, nonlinear mechanical systems, uh, what chaos means technically is that the outcome in such systems can be uh, infinitely dependent on the input. In other words, a, uh, an infinitesimal change in the initial conditions can produce a finite change in the result. The modern uh, rediscovery of that sort of thing uh, is attributable in part to meteorologists. And, uh, it's very important in meteorology that you can't actually predict certain aspects of the weather very easily because sometimes they're actually infinitely sensitive to the initial conditions. In science fiction, there's a famous puzzle of uh, what would happen if you could travel backward in time. Uh, if you changed things so that they were, the past was then incompatible with the present, then you couldn't get back to the same present. <laughs> So in some science fiction stories, as you know, the situation is resolved by having the character take actions in the past which made the present possible. So that instead of shooting his own grandfather before the grandfather had progeny, which would be really dangerous for the present, it turns out the main character is his grandfather. <laughs> he has gone backwards in time and uh, intervened by siring his own father, for example. Well, that's... The, by that means, the science fiction writer has created a consistent loop, a self-consistent loop. Well, so far, that's just science fiction. It does not, uh, does not have counterparts in reality, as far as we know. Well, uh, I love the idea of structure in the world and the power of theory uh, from a very early age. And I was very excited at discovering relationships among things. I loved that. It was great fun. And it continues to be great fun. And I think it's great fun for everybody who does it. It's just wonderful. And if people have lived without it, they should uh, probably uh, take it up because it's, uh, it's really splendid to look at the world in terms of connections, relationships. So many people just look at facts as disconnected objects, and they're not like that at all. There's an intricate pattern of interrelationship among things. When I was at Yale as an undergraduate, I learned a lot of math and physics rather formally, and of course a lot of other subjects as well. I loved the, some of the history classes and a number of other things. But uh, the math and physics that I learned, I learned almost by rote. I learned it in a very superficial manner. I didn't, most of it at least, and some of it I understood deeply, but most of it I understood at a rather superficial level. But it was sufficient to pass all the examinations and get very high grades and so on. And 
a student is in many respects just a machine for getting grades. And uh, so I did that sort of work as an undergraduate without really getting deeply involved in the understanding of what I was doing. And then I went to graduate school at MIT. And there, a few weeks after I got there, I attended the Harvard-MIT theoretical seminar, which was held that day at MIT. And uh, I didn't know what a theoretical seminar was. I thought it was something like a class. And uh, I looked around for some teacher to please, which is, after all, the point of a class. But it wasn't like that. There were a big shot professors sitting in the front row, and there were all sorts of other people, postdocs, graduate students, younger professors, and so on, scattered through the audience. Anybody who was interested in theoretical physics in the Cambridge Mass area was there. And the speaker was a Harvard graduate student who was about to get his PhD. He talked about his dissertation. And in the dissertation, he attempted to demonstrate approximately something that everybody believed to be true, which was that the uh, spin angular momentum of the lowest energy state of a nucleus called boron-10 was one unit. The ground state, so-called, of boron-10 had a spin of one. Uh, and what he did was to use so-called trial wave functions and vary them, and try to get the lowest energy possible. And by this approximate method, he found that the lowest energy seemed to come out with a wave function of spin one, which confirmed what he was trying to show. It wasn't a rigorous proof, but it was a, a significant bit of evidence. And then he finished his talk, and I wondered what would happen. Would the professors in the front row give him a sort of grade, or, you know, would people, because the classes were the only things that I understood. <laughs> Grades and pleasing the teacher, <laughs> sort of nonsense. <laughs> the real workings of science were something I understood only in, from a great distance, from reading history books and so forth. And um, what happened was that the big shot theoretical professors in the front row didn't say anything. But a little grubby man got up from right next to me, uh, somebody who looked as if he had crawled out of the basement at MIT. And uh, he said, uh, hey, uh, the spin ain't one. It's tree. They measured it. And suddenly it occurred to me in a sort of blinding flash that the job of the theoretician was not to please the famous professors in the front row, but to agree with what this grubby man found in the laboratory. <laughs> Agreeing with nature is the main thing. And suddenly I had a real idea what a theoretical scientist is and what the point of theoretical science is. I don't think it was his research he was talking about, but he had read about or heard about, by he had heard a rumor or something of an, of an experiment in which uh, the spin had been measured and was not what people thought it was going to be. It was quite important, actually, because at that time there was a new theory of the structure of light nuclei the so-called shell model, JJ coupling shell model, with which this new value agreed. But nobody was talking about that theory. They were talking about a bunch of older ideas at this uh, seminar. A few weeks later, one of the people working on that new theory came to give a seminar. And uh, that talk was completely compatible with boron-10 having three. In fact, it predicted that boron-10 would have spin three. So I began to have a real idea of how these things went. Well, there were a number of history professors at Yale whose courses I took. There was one that I liked very much called Hayo Holborn. His, uh, his classes were splendid. But there were several others that I liked as well. I've always been fascinated by history, and most of my reading has been about history. It still is. History and prehistory. History and, uh, and archaeology. Still true. But uh, I, what I liked about him was that he uh, tried to acquaint ordinary students, most of whom were not professional historians and weren't going to become professional historians, uh, tried to acquaint them with how history actually operates. What are the primary sources? What do we really know? How much is speculation? How much of what people conventionally say about history is actually false? And so on. I loved that. He tried to cut through the uh, conventional accounts 
of history that we all absorb in elementary courses and ordinary reading and newspaper articles and so on, and to get back to what really happened and what was really going on. And he emphasized that the way historians find that out is by studying the actual primary sources, not just reading one another's books. <laughs> there was a teacher in school who was, uh, who was fun. I don't know how that he had a big impact on my thinking, but he was a lot of fun. His name was Dow Bunyan Bean, and he had a Doctor of Divinity degree from some place in the South. I think he came from Georgia. And uh, he had lost his faith, and he had lost his interest in religion, and had become a, a secular uh, high school teacher. Everybody called him Doc Bean. And he was marvelous. He uh, was full of animation. He was relatively old at that time. Uh, at least we kids considered him relatively old. But he was very lively, jumping around and raising his voice and lowering his voice in all sorts of interesting ways with a, a racy line of talk about whatever he was discussing. And uh, suddenly stopping and asking somebody a question to make sure the person was listening, and writing down a, some little grade in his book. <laughs> Everything was lively and uh, it was marvelous. And if he didn't know something, then he would immediately send whoever asked the question to the library to see what was known on the subject. And I thought that was particularly splendid. Not that, of course, everything is available in a library. I mean, lots of things are simply not known and, uh, or maybe unavailable in a high school library. But the fact that he wanted to push every inquiry as far as it could be pushed with the local resources. That really impressed me. I thought that was great. And every time anybody was curious about something, uh, either he could answer it or somebody else in the class could answer it or else we went and used whatever resources were available to try to find out the answer. Well, I always thought learning could be fun. I mean, school wasn't necessary for me. Many people think of learning as connected with school, and I never did. For me, learning was something you did, and school was sort of an ancillary piece of equipment for connection with learning. It was, school was never the primary place of learning for me. I did learn things from time to time in school, but it was not the main thing. I spent my life learning, and school was just a little piece of it. My brother started me out on a lot of things, and my father to some extent. But once they did, then I could read or go to a museum or read a newspaper, I mean, go to a film, all sorts of different ways of learning. Uh, listen to the radio or whatever. But I felt that learning was a l sort of lifelong experience and school was just incidental in it. Uh, it's a pity that some people I know were put off particular subjects because they had teachers in those subjects who were uninspiring. My late wife, Margaret, for example, had a history teacher that turned her off history for decades, many decades. That's sort of a shame. History is such a glorious subject. Finally, as an adult, she began to realize that history had a lot of appeal. <laughs> She'd lost 30 years or something because of this <laughs> stupid teacher. <laughs> I just uh, drifted along studying physics because I had started in physics, and uh, it was nice. I enjoyed it. I liked it. I became very ambitious to learn more and to do something in physics. And, as I explained, when I got to graduate school, I began to understand what it meant to actually learn to do something rather than just to study in classes. And, uh, and it was fun. And then I went on and on. And I went to the Institute for Advanced Study for a year after graduate school. And, and then uh, I began to teach. My first job was at the University of Chicago. And then I came here. It was all very straightforward. The teacher at MIT, my teacher, who is still alive, Vicki Weisskopf, was a wonderful, inspiring person. He is still a wonderful, inspiring person. He is a really splendid person. And uh, working with him was, was marvelous. First of all, it was fun. But second, I really learned something, uh, not a fact or a theory particularly, but I learned a principle, which was that uh, Fancy mathematics doesn't have any value in science for its own sake. It may be useful to introduce some new mathematics or some fancy mathematics because it helps you to get the answer, helps you to formulate a new theory, or helps you to solve an old one. 
But just doing it for its own sake, just snowing people with mathematics is not a good idea. You should use uh, methods that are as simple as possible given uh, the richness of the material and the, uh, and the depth of the, of the theory that you're applying to it. That was very important because graduate students are frequently impressed with formalism. And Vicky just refused to be impressed with formalism. He said, that doesn't matter. That's just formalism. Uh, what matters is making a, uh, a, a new discovery, a new theoretical discovery, not just improving the formalism. The form, you proving the formalism may prove useful for making a new discovery. In that case, it's fine. But otherwise, it doesn't have any value. Don't be impressed by formal developments. Be impressed by real developments. That was very important for me. That's a very easy question. I have never done any hard work in my life. <laughs> I wish that I were capable of hard work. Maybe now, finally, I can do some hard work. But all my life I've been terribly lazy. And it's very bad these last few years because I've taken on much more than any human being could possibly do. Say I take on 50 times what a person could do. And then I work at, say, 2% efficiency. So that puts me behind by a factor of 2,500. <laughs> so <laughs> every day I fall several years further behind. And it's really, that's, that's painful. That's, that's a painful aspect of my life. If I could reduce the commitments or increase the efficiency, or both, I would be so much happier, but I haven't been able to do that. Here and there, something works, but, uh, you know, it's such a tiny fraction of all the things that I could do or should have done or might do or try to do. Some people are really hardworking. They really get things. Not only are they hardworking, but they are effectively hardworking. So they're efficient. They know how to organize their lives so that they actually get things done. And I've never been able to do that. So all my successes, whatever they are, are at the margin. There are a uh, <laughs> few things that I managed to get done, but, but uh, they're just a tiny number out of so many that, uh, that I would have liked to do and that I probably could have done if I'd been more sensibly organized. Well, in physics, for example, I could certainly have followed up my uh, work on uh, the quarks and uh, and uh, worked on quantum chromodynamics much earlier than I did. Uh, I could have, oh, there are a whole lot of things I could have done in physics. Lots of things I could have followed up more sooner and more effectively and so on. I was just, my attention was scattered and, and, uh, and I didn't work hard enough. I don't regret having a personal life. I don't regret what little time I managed to spend with my wife and children and so on. No, that I don't regret at all. But uh, a lot of it is really wasted. Reading is perhaps the worst thing. Reading is a terrible addiction. I mean, there's a lot of talk now about drugs and alcohol and so on, but reading is really bad. Uh, Gide, André Gide, talked about uh, ce vice impuni la lecture that unpunished vice, reading. Uh, somebody who's a real reading addict just reads everything. You try to read the newspaper every morning, all the junk, all the unimportant junk in the newspaper, the comics and the editorials and so on, all of which you could perfectly well skip. And, uh, and you read aspirin bottles and uh, you know, anything. It's just terrible. I started on cereal boxes. That was not a waste of time to learn to read but it was a cracker, cracker box. I didn't say it was a cereal box. Cracker box. Sunshine, I think. No, to start to read a cracker box and thereby learn to read, that's not so bad. But later on, just reading cracker boxes over and over again is a terrible, uh, addictive uh, practice, a compulsion. It's, it's horrible. Anyway, I've wasted a tremendous amount of time reading junk. That's one thing. Just an example. I don't know that I inspire them. Uh, I certainly, I digress a great deal. Uh, I don't know that it inspires I've never asked my students what they think of all those digressions. I think they just ignore them. I think they just pass right by. But I'm not sure. Sometime I should have somebody ask the students what they think of the digressions.
There certainly are a lot of them. I view uh, culture as uh, something that's unified. I don't like the idea of breaking it up artificially into art, science, and social science, humanities, uh, and so forth, and then specific fields of immunology and nuclear physics and uh, cultural anthropology and so on and so forth, because there are so many important things that connect one uh, field to another and, uh, and uh, principles that transcend many of these fields. And for me, it's always been true ever since I was little. And my brother and I used to look at the world together. That, that uh, it's all part of the same fabric. It's all part of human culture. It's part of the way we look at the world. Of course, the future is very interesting. I just got through meeting with a group of people that a couple of us have organized here at Caltech to hold a uh, symposium next year on the future. And we just finished yesterday a preliminary conference on the same subject. Uh, it's on visions of a sustainable world. Can we imagine what a sustainable global society might look like in uh, the middle of the next century? Can we figure out what some of the transitions are that we would have to undergo as a global society in order to get from here to there? And what are the trends in the world today that seem conducive to making those transitions. And I'm also organizing a, with some other people a uh, big research project on the same subject, visions of a sustainable world. Well, I think what, what uh, some of us are trying to do today, which is to understand uh, the general principles that underlie complex adaptive systems. All living things, uh, sets of living things, uh, computers that are programmed to solve problems and, and create strategies, uh, the chemical reactions that preceded life, so-called prebiotic chemical evolution, aspects of life like the immune system of mammals, and uh, complex adaptive systems on other planets throughout the universe, whatever they may be, must all obey certain principles fundamental principles of complex adaptive systems. They apply to all learning, adapting, and evolving systems throughout the universe. You know, what are those principles? And how do those things work? How do they process information so as to learn and adapt and, uh, and evolve? A universe, uh, the in, uh, environment, if you want to call it that, of a complex adaptive system is itself changing with time. Not only is it a time series with certain probabilities for certain events, but that time series is changing with time. And furthermore, in many cases, the environment is itself an adaptive complex system and is co-evolving as well as just changing with time. So you have two or more systems, uh, both of which are, I mean, both or all of which are evolving together. And uh, that, that fascinating to study and to think about. And these days, with the availability of large computers, one can begin to model such things. This is far too complicated to approach uh, analytically, at least uh, to begin with, by uh, writing down formulae and so on, uh, and solving equations. But, uh, but one can approach it uh, readily by making models, computer models. The study of complex adaptive systems cuts across archaeology and linguistics and economics and physics and chemistry and math and immunology and so on and so forth. It just goes on and on, computer science. Uh, and that's the kind of thing we're doing at the Santa Fe Institute. Santa Fe Institute, which I helped organize, is devoted to uh, giving people from virtually all fields the opportunity to work together to understand how complex adaptive systems work, and other complex systems as well, but principally complex adaptive systems. And we bring people from all of these disciplines, psychology, mathematics, uh, chemistry, uh, anthropology, uh, and so on and so forth, together for meetings, and we allow them or encourage them to form uh, uh, research networks and so forth. It's very exciting. I do a lot of the recruiting for the uh, Santa Fe Institute, for the science board, which uh, supervises the, the program, and also for individual researchers. And 
I, every time I phone somebody in some distant field, some famous busy person, I know that that person is going to say, well, what you're doing sounds interesting, but, you know, I'm already fully committed, and don't call me, I'll call you. And instead, in almost every single case, the person says, when can I come? I've been waiting for this. I've been waiting all my life for something like this. It's very uh, interesting. It's apparently a real felt need. And at the university, or an institute of technology, people feel, whether it's true or not, they feel that they must stick somehow to particular activities and discuss things in particular ways. And when they come to, to the Santa Fe Institute, they feel free of those restrictions. In one case, we had at a seminar on the evolution of the human languages, which I helped to organize. We had uh, five linguists from the same linguistics department, same university. Of course, they all knew one another very well. But at the Santa Fe Institute, they had conversations that they had never managed to have at home. Because it's a place where one is encouraged to make connections. Here they were actually all in the same discipline, the same department at the same university, but they were doing somewhat different things. And at home, they just each stated a position. I work on such and such an aspect of this. And the other one said, well, I work on this aspect of it. And Santa Fe Institute, they began to argue about how you could put these together and uh, to what extent particular grammatical universals, for example, were explained partially by one approach and partially by the other approach. So some sort of synthesis of the two points of view began to be uh, formed, uh, which the two colleagues had never done at home. It was just a name which I gave, actually, to certain particles. They, they were called uh, peculiar or curious or strange or something particles because they uh, were produced copiously in reactions. Initially, they were observed in cosmic rays, uh, so the reactions were in the atmosphere. Later on, the reactions were in the laboratory as an accelerator. But in either case, they were produced copiously. But they took what, by our standards, is a long time to decay. 10 to the minus 10th seconds, for example, is a very long time. A short time would be 10 to the minus 24th seconds. So that's uh, 1 over 1 with 24 zeros. Well, 1 over 1 with 10 zeros is uh, obviously a very long time compared to that. And uh, it wasn't understood initially, back in 1952, uh, how they could be produced in large numbers and then take a long time to decay. And uh, I explained it with the so-called strangeness theory. But I just gave uh, the name to these particles, uh, strange particles. People were calling them things like that, peculiar particles, strange particles, curious particles, because they had this apparently paradoxical behavior of being produced strongly and decaying weakly. And I explained why that happened and uh, facetiously gave the name strangeness to the quantum number that was involved. The quantum number was conserved in the production but violated in the decay. And uh, so the production could be done by the strong interactions and could be strong, and the decay went by the weak interactions and, uh, and was slow. Uh, complex adaptive systems are a much more difficult subject of study than uh, the fundamental laws of physics, for example. And among those, uh, the study of human beings is, uh, which are fairly complex, at least for the Earth. <laughs> uh, the study of human beings is a very difficult subject. So it's easier to We study. haven't made so much progress on it because it's more difficult. The fact that we are studying ourselves in that case perhaps may also make some, make for some difficulty. My forthcoming book is called, on all of these things, is called The Quark and the Jaguar, Adventures in the Simple and the Complex. And the simple refers to the fundamental laws of physics. The complex refers to things like us. <laughs> and that's perfectly correct. It may not be the way the person in the street first would state it, but the fact is the fundamental laws of physics are very simple. Uh, it may take a couple of years to learn the right notation and so on, to write them down simply, but uh, they are intrinsically simple. And it's not true of uh, complex, complex systems. I would have liked to 
to pioneering exploration in areas that had been very little studied and find, uh, make new discoveries in natural history or conceivably in archaeology. Uh, it's a romantic dream of a great many kids, and I still have it. But I've never really done it, but I have poked around in an awful lot of remote places in the last few years, and that's been fun. That's been a lot of fun, and it's been extremely educational. And it's also helped me a lot with my activities in the conservation of uh, biological diversity. Uh, seeing, because most of the problems of conservation of biological diversity are in the tropics. It's where most of the biological diversity is, and it's where the biggest problems are. Problems of rapidly burgeoning populations, poverty, uh, and so forth. Uh, so the, the biggest uh, treasures of biological diversity are in the tropics, and the dangers are the greatest in the tropics. And uh, of course, nothing can be done about those without simultaneously working on the living conditions of uh, rural people in the tropics. One has to build a kind of structure in which those people and the, their search for a better life is uh, in harmony with uh, protecting uh, biological diversity so that they see, have a stake in it and, and perceive that they have a stake in it. Uh, but anyway, poking around in so many of those places over the last uh, eight years or so has helped a lot with, uh, with my work on that. And seeing how the uh, animals and plants in the area uh, relate to one another and, and the uh, extraordinary variety that they exhibit and the relationships uh, the, the relationships among their uh, in their taxonomy and the relationships in their behavior are both uh, exciting to try to understand they form a system. The, uh, the organisms aren't just individuals. They form a very complicated system with all sorts of very, very complex patterns of interaction. I don't claim to have studied those things very deeply, but even just the superficial study is extraordinarily interesting and has been very valuable in my, uh, in my conservation work. It's very important that one do that, that economics be generalized to include the, uh, the values in, for example, biological diversity and many other things. It's all part of the program of trying to get closer to true costs and true values in economics. Now, most very advanced researchers in economics uh, agree that that sort of a thing is in principle desirable and then they do some work on it, theoretical work on it, and they have various constructs uh, like the social rate of discount which measures the debt between the generations, so-called intergenerational equity, and of course they have externalities. Uh, if uh, something like the air or the oceans or uh, the, for the forests are treated as free goods, that's not, obviously not true. Uh, and uh, so you try to charge for them in some sense, theoretically, by treating them as externalities and internalizing them, which means that uh, you actually do charge. Anyway, all of this is done in the textbooks and the cost of information is considered. But in practice, in economic practice in so many places, lending organizations and so forth, most of this is forgotten and approximated by zero. And value is assigned to those things that have value in some trivial sense. And costs are trivial costs that are very easily quantified. And all the things that are difficult to quantify are put equal to zero. Difficult to quantify are put equal to zero. And I've been upset by that for 20 years. And for 20 years, I've been trying to f figure out ways to fight it and to make propaganda against it and to get people to improve their ways of thinking and their ways of behaving uh, so that uh, one can get much closer. Our, the survival of our society on this planet and the survival of our, the other organisms on the planet is very much bound up with uh, how soon we can uh, learn to, to uh, charge true costs and appreciate true values and combine those things with the usual economic calculations. Usual economic calculations are caricatures.
And these huge costs are often not correct because they leave out some other things. They assume f f free markets, and in fact, often the market isn't free. There are all kinds of market impediments. Again, I don't mean the brilliant economists, but uh, the people who do these things in practice often make these errors. And uh, uh, if you remove market imperfections, frequently you find the costs are very small or negative, that you actually make money. For example, saving energy in many cases will make money and reducing carbon dioxide emissions will in some cases make money rather than costing. But you will still find lots of people who will calculate that it's very expensive and will cost a lot. And I'm talking about making money in conventional terms. I'm not talking about uh, making money in terms of true value, but it's just an actual, actual money. Taksomyke. I don't know what you say. I don't th you, uh, later on that evening, you make a speech, uh, a brief speech. I just said a few words, partly in Swedish, about uh, this. Sw I, I mentioned the, s the new photographs of the Earth from space showing a blue planet and how precious the, our blue planet is. Uh, we don't know of any good place to live anywhere close by other than this blue planet, and we ought to take care of it. And I congratulated the Swedes uh, in their own language on proposing the first UN conference on the environment, which was held three years later in 1972 in Stockholm. Uh, that's the sort of thing I talked about. And I said a few other things. I said that the beauty of the laws of physics and the beauty of nature and so on were not to me different things, but aspects of the same thing. The second UN conference on the environment, 20 years after the first, is to be held in 92 in Rio de Janeiro in, in Brazil. And uh, uh, that will be a very exciting time. The, the discussions there will be of the greatest importance for the future of the planet. There's a man who is making a film, a 90-minute film, to open that meeting. He's the same man who made the film shown at the first conference in 1972. And uh, I was just meeting with him last night and the night before to discuss some of the things that he ought to film. And, and uh, I may even appear briefly in the, in the 92 film. In Brazil, actually, in the forests, shown in the forests in Brazil. But it's exciting that the Brazilians are trying to preserve now what fragments are left of the Atlantic forest that stretches from the, near the coast, from the uh, north of Brazil all the way down into Paraguay and even a few kilometers into Argentina. Oh, my wife uh, liked it. I know that. She really liked it. She enjoyed the whole thing very much. Not the publicity, particularly. She was not anxious for publicity, but just the whole, the whole series of events appealed to her a great deal. We had a wonderful time going to Stockholm together. It was really nice. My daughter and my son reacted oppositely on the morning when they notified us. Uh, you know how you get a call from somebody. Nowadays, it's from the Academy, but at that time, it was from some news medium uh, at 3.30 uh, in the morning here in California. Well, I was pleased to hear that I'd gotten this thing. I was not pleased to be deprived of all that sleep because people kept calling. And finally, Margaret said we should get up and get dressed and she would make coffee because obviously we were not going to get any more sleep and some reporter and photographer might be coming any minute from the Los Angeles Times. So we did. We got up. She made coffee. The reporter and photographer showed up from the, from the Los Angeles Times. My daughter dug deeper under the covers and didn't come out for hours. She didn't want to have anything to do with any of this. But my son, who was seven years younger, who was six years old at that time, was delighted with the idea that a reporter and photographer were coming to the house. He wanted to be photographed, and he had his Halloween pirate costume because it was the day before Halloween, October 30th. So he put on, he got all dressed and put on his pirate costume and came out and of course the Los Angeles Times photographed him. <laughs> the next day, smack in the middle of the front page of the LA Times, in fact right on top of the front page of the LA Times was Nick in his pirate costume. 
<laughs> and, uh, but it was, he had a, it was a mixed blessing for him because he hadn't calculated that everybody got the paper and that everybody in his school would see his picture on the front page of the paper and that they would kid him about it. Everything has always gone wonderfully for me. All the obstacles were internal, just inefficiency, neurosis, uh, all the obstacles have been internal. I can't really say that, uh, that it's any uh, obstacles were placed in my path. I've had the most wonderful things happen to me. A full scholarship to Yale, for example. Donated by somebody whom I met later and who became a wonderful friend. Trini Barnes, Trini McCormick Barnes. It was called the Medill McCormick Scholarship. It was anonymous and I didn't know who had donated it. But it was Trini Barnes in memory of her brother who died young. And it allowed, paid for everything at Yale, all my expenses. It was an extraordinary scholarship. It was the only one like that. And it was the only one that would have permitted me to attend the university there. Fantastic luck. Then I had some trouble with graduate schools. But, uh, and I hadn't wanted to go to MIT. But it turned out that MIT was splendid, especially because of Vicky Weisskopf, who was my advisor at MIT. So that also was just terrific. Everything has gone very, very well always, and all the difficulties have been self-generated. <laughs> Except the death of my wife. That, of course, was tragic and not something that I brought about. When I was a kid, when I was a graduate student, I worried about failing. And not only did I worry about failing, but I worried that if I actually did something, uh, then it might turn out to be a failure. And if I didn't do anything, then I wouldn't have the, the comparison of what I was doing with what I ought to be doing. So lots of graduate students go through that, and it keeps them from doing work for a while. But finally, I did some things. I wrote a dissertation, and I worked on other matters, and so on. Well, the problem at that time was that I didn't understand what was re new research. So that a lot of ideas that I had were actually worth publishing and worth discussing with people. And I just dismissed them as trivial. I thought, wow, this is so silly. Everybody must know this. Everybody must know that. But in fact, they were new and not totally silly uh, points. And uh, a lot of them, actually. And a lot of ideas which I could have simply followed up, written up, and so on. But I, I didn't realize what, what a good idea was. In fact, I've often had that problem. I had doubts that I would ever do anything important. And uh, that, as I say, so in certain cases, that keeps you from sitting down and trying anything, because then as long as you haven't tried, you can figure, well, if I tried, it would be OK. <laughs> yeah. So I, I went through a little bit of that in graduate school. And then I've had a lot of problems writing things, because uh, I'm a perfectionist about writing. And that means, again, that I don't sit down and do it because I'm worried that if I do it, it'll be imperfect. But if I don't do it, I can always imagine that it would have been perfect if I'd done it. So uh, that was a problem. When I was supposed to be writing my dissertation, for example, at MIT, I read the Tibetan Book of the Dead. <laughs> Another thing is that would probably be a good idea would be to cut out certain things in order to devote more attention to the rest and do a th thorough, good job on them. So the trouble is when your attention is fragmented too far, then uh, you can't really have deep and good ideas. If you, uh, you, for example, if you try to do science, but you become, a, you become deeply involved in business, let's say, then what matters is what you think about when you wake up in the middle of the night. If you wake up in the middle of the night thinking about the balance sheet, then you're not doing science, because science, theoretical science at least, consists of waking up in the middle of the night with, a, with an idea for, for your theory. In other words, the, the parts of the mind out of awareness are chewing on the wrong thing. And they can't chew on everything. So your creative skills are uh, rationed in a certain sense. You can't, you can't have them in every field. <laughs>
And what you're really working on, you can tell, is what you wake up in the middle of the night thinking about. Just because somebody is a physicist doesn't mean that that person has any particular understanding of society or the future or the way things are going uh, or any particular uh, authority to discuss such matters. So one has to be careful saying that because I won the Swedish prize in physics, I can now make a pronouncement on uh, all sorts of political subjects and so on. I think that one has to be very careful of that. But just because one has won the Swedish prize in some scientific subject doesn't mean one has to shut up either. Uh, it's just that one shouldn't abuse, I think, one shouldn't abuse the privilege excessively of having this sort of title by sounding off on all sorts of things without thinking deeply about them. But if one joins with colleagues from many, many other walks of life, many disciplines, to think deeply about some important issue facing humanity, and then one says something about it, particularly together with those other people, I think that's very good and should be greatly encouraged. And that's quite different. But when one says something, again, it should not, I think, be excessively polemical. It can have a polemical uh, streak to it, otherwise it may not get much publicity and people may not pay much attention to it. But I think it, uh, scientists have some responsibility to make more or less responsible statements about things rather than things that are merely shrill and, and polemical. Right. And that also they should initiate wherever possible, together with these colleagues from many other fields, serious discussions and serious research on issues facing the world, not just off-the-cuff pronouncements. And anyway, that's what I've tried to do. I've tried to help organize such efforts to think deeply about things together with colleagues from a great many different uh, uh, sectors. They were entitled to their opinions, and they should not have been persecuted for their opinions. They should not have had their clearances removed by some uh, perversion of the security apparatus because of a conspiracy by Edward and Louis Straws and various other people, Air Force people and so on. I think that was a crime against Robert Oppenheimer. He was entitled to his opinion and he was entitled to propagate his opinion. And making him out to be some sort of enemy agent because he had a different opinion from theirs was terrible. However, I personally uh, supported at that time and still do the uh, development of the thermonuclear weapon. I think at the time when Stalin's Soviet Union was obviously doing the same thing, and, uh, and we know who was doing it, too. <laughs> uh, 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 Sakharov and uh, Yabe Zildovich, my friend Yabe Zildovich, and, uh, and uh, Kurchatov, and so on. Uh, at the time when those people were doing that, I think there was not much alternative to our doing it in this country. But I consider it that conspiracy evil and reprehensible to uh, try to label Robert Oppenheimer as some sort of a fiend just because he had a set of opinions different from theirs. Basically, his opinions were those of the Army, and theirs were those of the Air Force. And as I say, I don't disagree with the opinions of the Air Force, but I think there was no reason to try to make out somebody who happened to agree with the Army instead to be a fiend. Uh, Robert thought that it was very important to develop small uh, fission weapons. I was never particularly fond of that idea, but uh, he and a number of other people thought that was very important. He thought it was very bad to work on the thermonuclear weapons, and in particular, he and a lot of other and a lot of other scientists believed that we could reach an agreement with the Soviet Union not to develop the thermonuclear weapons, so that neither side would have them. Conceivably, they were right. I tend to doubt it because of who was in charge of the Soviet Union at that time and so on. But uh, Stalin did die, of course, uh, around that time, in uh, 1953. By the time of the Oppenheimer hearing, actually, uh, Stalin was gone. And by that time, maybe it was possible to make such a deal. I don't know. It's not possible to know. But 
the, the, the reason so many people are angry at Edward and at uh, many other of those conspirators uh, is that uh, there was consider it unconscionable to misuse the security apparatus to try to uh, blacken uh, Robert Oppenheimer's name just because of a disagreement on policy. There are the fundamentalists uh, who believe in the literal interpretation of the uh, Bible in this country who are trying to uh, make it difficult to uh, explain to students uh, about evolution. And they used to try to get the teaching of evolution suppressed. They've given up on that. Now the push has been in recent years to try to require teachers who explain evolution to explain some sort of nonsense at the same time and give it equal time, and equal emphasis, some sort of nonsense based essentially on literal interpretation of the Bible. Uh, I helped to fight against that in the uh, Louisiana creationism case by uh, circulating among a lot of people a, uh, an amicus curiae brief for the Supreme Court. It was signed by virtually all of the American winners of the Swedish Prizes in Science and by virtually all of the state academies of science and may have helped to influence the justices in their 7-2 to two decision. I don't know whether it did or not. That two justices could have voted the other way, I have found appalling, just appalling. Just almost unbelievable, especially when one looks at the arguments that they used. Uh, I was here then, Caltech, and I was a consultant at RAND, and. Uh, uh, thinking about these issues myself a little bit. But I was very young and I was timid about doing much about it. Not timid exactly, I just didn't think I could accomplish a lot. I wasn't afraid of anything, I just didn't figure I could accomplish a great deal. So I wasn't very active. I should have been perhaps. I should have written my views at least in a letter to the newspapers or something like that, but I didn't. Uh, I did talk with the people at Caltech though. Uh, my impression at the time, and it hasn't changed much over the years, is that uh, Linus was complaining legitimately about health threats to local populations and to the population of the world. In retrospect, it turns out that he should have concentrated much more heavily on local populations who were really getting it. I felt, and I still think it's true, that he was exaggerating a lot of the, the data and extrapolating uh, results uh, from known results much too much and making somewhat extravagant claims. But I thought even if one restricted oneself to things that were probably right, that he had a point. And so I was sort of in the middle. And uh, I remember Lee DuBridge, the president, was uh, unhappy about Linus's uh, remarks. And I said, well, I agree with you about this and this and this. And he said, oh, well, that's nice. And I said, but I don't agree with you about the rest. <laughs> <laughs> and he, people couldn't believe that I was disagreeing with both sides, but I was. I thought that denying that there was any problem and just saying that national security considerations overrode everything else or whatever it was they wanted to say, I thought it was absurd. At the same time, I thought Linus was exaggerating a little bit the evidence and going too far with the evidence. And it turns out there were plenty of bad things to say, and if he had restricted himself largely to local populations, it wouldn't have been so bad. But in fact, uh, he was, I think, exaggerating the, uh, the, the, the threat in the terms in which he stated it. But uh, what I was hoping was that we could find a solution, and one that wouldn't compromise national security too much, and one that would meet some of the objections of, on the grounds of health and safety. And what was obvious was that it was tests in the atmosphere that were uh, compromising health. And it was tests in the atmosphere that were rather easy to detect. So that if there was cheating, you could find out somebody was cheating. And so why didn't we just try, along with the other side, to stop tests in the atmosphere? Well, it took a number of years before people finally got around to uh, agreeing that that might be a good idea. And finally, the treaty was signed in 1963, but that was some seven years later. When Linus got the, his second prize from the uh, Nobel 
uh, foundation for peace. A number of people here thought that it was not a good idea and that it should have gone to those who negotiated the treaty. Uh, it should have gone to Jerry Wiesner, for example, who helped the, uh, to formulate the American position on the treaty and so forth. Uh, to Kennedy and Khrushchev, maybe, I don't know. I thought it wasn't such a bad idea that it went to Linus, even though I felt he had exaggerated back in the 50s uh, the scientific evidence for his position. Uh, in any of these controversies, there's a whole spectrum of people doing the work. Some of them are way over on one side, some of them are in the middle, some of them are on the other side, and it requires the... Uh, I, I don't mean on the other side, I'm saying that wrong. Some people are exaggerating the data. Some people are ex excessively conservative, but still on, uh, defending the same position. Some people are in between. And it's the whole spectrum of people who constitute the, uh, the movement, whatever it is, that's, that's producing the effect. And each segment, so to speak, plays its role. Uh, if there's somebody way over there, that makes me a moderate, <laughs> uh, and so on. And I felt that Linus, uh, even though I th thought he had been too strident and it exaggerated here and there, that. I thought that uh, as far as the Peace Prize was concerned, which is not given for scientific accuracy, uh, he, he did deserve it. He was the one who made the big fuss. It's too bad that it was a scientist, I thought, who was doing this exaggeration. It's better if the scientists leave the exaggeration to somebody else and scientists stick closely to the consequences of the evidence. But uh, anyway, I uh, thought it was a good idea that he got the Peace Prize. But he apparently felt that the community here hadn't supported him enough, and, and he left. But what I could never forgive Linus was not anything along these lines, but just the fact that he was worshipped so much, including by his wife and children. I think that it's very important that human society, in facing the future, look to the long run as well as the short run. And our institutions are not very well adapted to that. Our institutions are not good for that. Our political institutions are hooked up so that things or problems are looked at mostly in the short run. Uh, predictions of the long run are, of course, less reliable. And so that also militates against paying attention to long times. I think, nevertheless, it's extremely important that we do so and that we seek ways of reforming our institutions so that they are more sensitive to long-term concerns so that we're using, uh, in, for many purposes, what you might call small discount rates instead of discounting the future at a huge rate. And at the same time, I think that we must learn to strike a proper balance between cooperation and competition. In uh, free market countries, we appreciate the value of competition, the great usefulness of competition, the great usefulness of uh, encouraging individuals to compete as well as uh, organizations to compete. That's all very well, but there's also a role for cooperation at the same time, and we have to learn to strike a balance between them. Neither one by itself is as good as a proper harmonious mixture of the two. And so there again, we need institutions that favor, uh, that, favor that as well. A couple of months ago, I was in uh, Sabah uh, in the forest and also in the capital, Kota Kinabalu, formerly Jesselton. Sabah used to be called North Borneo, and it's uh, part of Malaysia now. They were celebrating the 25th anniversary of the museum in Kota Kinabalu. And uh, I went over there to look at the museum. And in honor of the 25th anniversary, they were having a blowgun contest. All the visitors were invited to shoot three blowgun darts at a target and see how well they could do at hitting it. And I was with my friend Dan Martin, who's the program officer for environment and population and several other things at the MacArthur Foundation. And he took a turn at the blowgun and first shot, the first dart missed completely. The second one was on the edge of the target. The third one was closer in. And uh, then they asked me to try, and I'd done some practicing with my Amazonian blowgun at home, uh, firing at, a, at an Amazonian uh, doll figure a few feet high. Uh, 
And uh, so I, uh, I was probably just lucky. But anyway, I aimed the blowgun a little bit above the target and blew and went smack in the middle of the bullseye with the first dart. Of course, I refused to try the other two so as not to spoil a perfect record. <laughs> but those people were quite impressed. <laughs> Anyway, when I came home with the blowgun and the Amazonian uh, figure that I use as a target, my son Nick was really delighted. He's in his 20s, was then, I guess, in his early 20s. He was very pleased. And he said, you know, he said, I must be growing up, he said, because I find these things that you do much more interesting than I used to. He said, either that or else the things that you do are much more fun than what you used to do. So we, we fired blowgun darts together for hours at this target. Well, actually, I began to feel sorry for the target after a while because it's a rather nice object itself. And so I finally stopped using it and started using other things. So it actually is not too badly wounded. A few nicks, yeah. Well, my, yeah, including my son. He's a nick also. <laughs>